Hello, and welcome to Someone's Gotta Make It. On this show, I'm gonna be talking to the founders and leaders behind businesses that make products you encounter all the time in your daily life, but never really think about. And I'm gonna be talking to them about how they overcame the growing pains of building a great business from scratch. And the challenges that they experience growing their businesses are probably the same exact challenges that you're experiencing right now if you're growing something of your own. So listen up, they're gonna tell you practical ways that they found to overcome what they were struggling with that might help you as well. My name is Ben Goldstein. I'm the host of the show. I'm also the VP of marketing at Nutshell. Nutshell is a CRM and email marketing platform. We help thousands of companies around the world get organized and automate the small stuff so they can focus on what really matters, which is building stronger relationships with their buyers. On this episode, human skin. Just hear me out for a second. My guest is Eric Merle. Eric is the chief business innovation officer for Genoskin. Genoskin takes living skin tissue donated from cosmetic procedures and keeps it alive for the purposes of injectable pharma testing. So what does that mean? Well, their technology makes it possible for drug companies to see how our skin reacts to injectable drugs, like vaccines or injectable insulin, without the need for human test subjects. I think that's pretty cool. Now, like a lot of modern companies, Genoskin has offices and teams all over the world, which can create some headaches when it comes to effective communication. And that's what Eric and I are going to talk about today. We're going to discuss the challenges of communicating between departments, communicating with your direct reports, being heard and understood at meetings, and whether or not technology and software tools can help with any of this stuff. We're also going to talk about why your arm swells up after a shot. Here's my conversation with Eric Merle of Genoskin. Enjoy. Hey, Eric, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, man. It's a pleasure. You spent 20 years in the biotech field in one form or another. What is it about this industry that fascinates you? I guess I started by being a scientist or going to school to be one. I do love the fact that we can have an impact on overall human health. Do you remember the, the first moment where you thought, I want to devote my career to this, to improving the human condition through science? No, because it's been so long. As, as a kid, I spent a lot of times uh, near hospitals. And uh, the first idea was to go to medical school and then into research and then to commercialize research tools, but always within science. So commercialized research tools, what is that exactly? It's a fancy way of saying that I was a sales guy <laughs> and, uh, and that I still am. I look at things more from a strategic point of view today. But every day is about understanding what the needs are, what may be future needs, and seeing if you can meet those. Genoskin.com describes the product you make as ex vivo human skin model. So ex vivo means what exactly? Ex vivo means outside of the body. So it means that we maintain the skin alive outside of a human body. So we biostabilize the tissue uh, in such a way that it maintains all of its properties. And that's actually kind of a fun thing in that uh, you can see it tan if you put UV on it. You can see it repair itself if you wound it. And the hair will grow. It's actually alive. And the patient from which it, it comes is still alive as well. So we work from uh, donations from patients who undergo tummy tucks mostly. Yeah, walk me through that process in layman's terms, how, how these skin models go from the body of a living donor to a, a testing platform in a laboratory. So there are about, in the U.S., 200,000 people every year that undergo tummy tucks. And that's one of the types of surgical procedures that we work with. From that point, we actually work with the surgical discard as if it were a organ transplant. And we end up bringing it to our labs within hours and working on it so that we stabilize the tissue. Otherwise, it would just fall apart and die. We have to, to stabilize it so that it maintains all the properties. And then we have this window during which we can work on the tissue that is of about seven to 10 days. The first time you came face to face with the skin models that Genoskin develops, did it kind of weird you out? Did the hair on your arm stand up? It probably is hard for someone who hasn't hung out in hospitals or had surgeries. It may seem a little gruesome. It is a piece of skin with all the attached layer as you would see in a surgical procedure. So 
it can be a little bit shocking. I don't think uh, there was a TV channel that, that did a, an interview and, and came to, to take some videos. I don't think they, they showed the tissue. Otherwise, they probably would have said these are graphic images. But I was okay. The entire injectable pharma industry today relies on the work Genoskin does. And for people who don't know what I mean by injectable pharma, we're just talking about anything that goes into your body through a needle, right? Yeah, a needle or even no needles today. So today there are technologies that, and they've been around for a long time, but technologies where you don't have a needle that'll just push through a jet of a compound into the tissue, a vaccine, for example. Uh, There are technologies now also that are patches that you will just put on your skin and will diffuse into the tissue. Anytime a drug goes through the skin, so as an injectable, People usually would would have an interest in in working with us, yes. Yeah. So that's insulin, vaccines, as you mentioned. What else? What could I have swimming around my body one day, thanks to the work that your company does? So today, there are a lot of drugs that are even put in intravenously that are looked at being put subcutaneously, so under the first two layers of the skin. And those can be various medicines. They don't have to be targeting skin, So skin is just the medium by which you bring it into the body. Skin, you have to think of it as the body's biggest organ. It's the biggest barrier we have to the outside world. It's what prevents anything from the outside to get inside. But it's also the barrier that you have to pass if you want to bring anything into the body. So we've worked even with people who had delivery devices, pumps, that were inserted into the body. You were talking about insulin. There are people who have insulin pumps that constantly pump into the body some insulin. We've worked with some of those folks. There there are very many drugs today. Just the injectable drugs, I think, in development and on the market today is roughly 7,000 drugs in development, according to the World Health Organization. Do you find it hard explaining to friends and neighbors what your company actually makes? No, it just freaks people out. But It's, in a sense, very easy. I just say, well, we keep human skin alive and we use it as a a way of testing things on humans without humans. And and it's funny because the early days of the company, our mission was clearly to be an alternative to animal testing. Right. And that still resonates with a lot of people because the industry still uses a lot of animals. It doesn't mean that it serves much purpose, but they still use a lot of animals. And today, we really highlight the fact that this is true first in human data. Before you even go into human, you can generate human data. So what does a chief business innovation officer do exactly? What's a typical week look like for you? I spend most of my week actually having conversation with different groups on understanding what they're doing and how we could, at the very least, replicate in human platforms what they've seen as data in animals. I do a lot of dreaming and dreaming with others and trying to figure out how we can solve the problem in something that is a human, but isn't a full human. That's what most of my week is like. But next week, I'll be at a conference. So we're having conversations with all sorts of folks. Tell me a little more about the target customer at Genoskin these days. Who are you selling to? So our target customer today is mostly the biotech and pharma industry. That has evolved from the academic and dermocosmetic industry, which was what it started with 10 years ago. Today, that represents about 40% of our revenue. And so the majority now comes from biotech and pharma. And, and what led to that pivot from cosmetics to pharma? What was the thought process behind that decision? So it wasn't as much a decision as it was an innovation. It was uh, about four years ago, actually, when we opened the lab in the United States and when we developed a way to maintain one more layer of the skin. Skin is composed of three layers. It's composed of the outermost layer called the epidermis. Underneath that, you have the dermis, And underneath that, you have a fat layer called the hypodermis. And prior to that technical development, we were unable to have the adipose tissue stay functional. Think of it as, because it is a fat layer, 
and we maintain that tissue in a body temperature environment, 37 degrees Celsius, think of it as any fat at 37 degrees, you put any weight on it, even the weight of skin, which is very light, it collapses. So what we needed to do was find a way to maintain that tissue structurally sound. We developed a model about four years ago, and that's when we also were able to then address the question of injecting, where a lot of injectables are actually put in, into that sub-Q space. Mm -hmm. Did that innovation create any challenges for you in your role in terms of finding and attracting an entirely new buyer persona? It was adding to the, the persona more than it was changing it completely, because even in the other types of customers, they were still researchers, heads of research that we sold into. It wasn't a completely different persona in that sense. We were still selling into research, but it did make some changes into the fact that now we were talking to customers that may have other questions. So the dermal cosmetic industry, maybe a little bit of a pun to say they were looking at things skin deep, but they, they weren't looking to characterize as much of what was happening. When you're starting to look at people who are injecting molecules, they're wanting to really understand the mechanism of action of something, the efficacy of a drug. Not just, hey, can you show me a pretty picture and will it make my skin look brighter? It's an exaggeration. Not the whole industry does that. Uh, I kind of bundle two industries when I say dermal cosmetics. The dermatological companies who cater with drugs to the health of skin, those are medical drugs. The cosmetic industry is different. They don't make any medical claims. They make marketing claims. Give me a sense of how much the business has grown while you've been a part of it. So it's pretty cool you asked me today because yesterday the Financial Times reported their FT1000 ranking for 2022 on the top 1,000 companies that had in terms of growth in Europe. And we scored a whooping 531. So hey, congratulations. Like over the <laughs> I mean, it seems like you're really far to the podium when you're 531. <laughs> but if you look really at then narrowing it down into our industry, it meant that in Europe, we were actually fourth. Mm -hmm. So in the chemicals and pharmaceutical sector, if you filter their data into that, we came in fourth with a growth of 300% over the past three years. Even with COVID, it has been a tremendous growth. I want to talk about communication for a bit because I know your team is distributed in different cities and in different countries. And communication always becomes a challenge when a business starts growing. As your customer base grew and you expanded into new markets, you had this evolution. What were the communication challenges that you started seeing? It's interesting because communication challenges seem to be very contradicting we have the challenge of needing to have a common message, but we have to cater it to different industries. It's an interesting dilemma here to have to communicate differently because of those different industries. The advantages of what we do and how it may resonate with someone might be different whether they are working on a pharmaceutical compound or they are working on a cream that will protect your skin from UVs. The challenge in the messaging is that we have to maintain that common message, and then we have to have a derivative of that message that will resonate more with one particular client or another. So I'm working right now with the marketing team on how we make one of the automated slide decks that will show during the conference. The objective of that slide deck is that in a couple seconds, people catch something that catches their eye. It's not the full explanation, but it's one word, often a call to action, that will pique their interest. And so there's a lot of effort in finding those sentences that will resonate with one type of customer or another. And did you feel like the entire organization was not at first on the same page in delivering these unified messages? So what were the specific conflicts that you saw popping up? Well, the advantage of being a small company <laughs> is that there are less conflicts. 
doesn't mean that they're smaller, but we can get them quickly resolved because there are a few people involved. The specifics of things that were challenging were, well, do we have to have simple questions such as, what language do we do our website in? So originally, we're a French company. We quickly actually decided to have an English website. Mm -hmm. A uniquely English website. And we have French customers today that reach out to us in English. And it's funny because scientists often speak in English. But that was one thing. When it comes to working with Asian customers, and we have customers in Japan, in Korea, in China, in Malaysia, in India, what languages do we use? Some countries prefer their own language. And so we've had to adapt. But overall, the message, I feel, has been quite well organized and communicated. Well, let's move from external communication to internal communication. How do you stay on top of everything you need to know at your company without being over-involved? Nobody wants to be a micromanager. Yeah, nobody wants to be a micromanager, and worse than being one is having one. <laughs> the, the <laughs> To stay on top, you have to actually know how to create the base for you to be on top. And it's a base of humans, so you have to know how to delegate. And you have to also know how you get back the metrics necessary for you to do your job. So as we've grown, we've had to add on tools. Mm -hmm. It's easy when you're just two people and you say, hey, can we do that on Monday? Sure. Sure. Two people involved. Now, when you start having six people involved, two are in one country, three are in another, and then you got one other person that's traveling at that same time, it gets more challenging. Well, give me an example of that. What do you mean? Well, setting up a meeting. Yeah. Setting up a meeting with an external person. Then you've got your coordination of calendars, their coordination. There are a lot of tools today where you may want to send your calendar shared and what's available, what's not available. Some people like it, some don't like it. Or there are coordinated tools where, or collaborative tools where you may check in. That's used a lot during conferences. But it's always tricky to figure out the best schedule, the time zones. And so today on my calendar, I always have two time zones, the, the lab in the Boston area in Salem and the lab in Toulouse, France. Those are my two time zones. I like to tell people I work nine to five, but in two different time zones. Mm. So it's a long day. I think you made that comment when you looked at my calendar one day. Yeah. It's a brutal schedule, Eric. Yeah. Hey, I take naps during the day. Yeah, good for you. It, it, it's important to be organized and to, to be able to delegate. Yeah. It's also, as you grow, all that more important to understand, I was talking about metrics of what's going on, to understand what work is being done because in the event that someone has to add to that work, replace that work, pick up on that work, we've been putting in place a lot of those tools from our calendars to how we manage projects to how we interact with customers and maintain those interactions. Besides calendars and scheduling, you know, what other specific tools are you currently using to keep in touch with your team and other members of the company? And how have those tools made things better or worse when it comes to internal communication? We've decided to take a unified approach on one main platform on which we have our emails, calendars, and, and all that, and instant messaging between the, the people in the company. Specific tools to that. So, as you know, we work with a, with a CRM we like. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I mean, you you can call it out by name if you want to, Eric. I mean, <laughs> all right, fine. I'll dro I'll name drop. It's Nutshell. Yeah, we love thank it. you. <laughs> <laughs> so that has been a big part of how we can keep track of the interactions with our customers. Even now, do some of our marketing activities. And then we've added project management tools. So there are a couple out there that, that exist. We, we took a decision on one particular one. Will that be the tool that we need when we get to the next level of growth? Maybe not. As we grow, we've added different layers of tools. And those different layers of tools provide 
an answer to a need as we're growing. So we have more complex projects with our customers. We're now needing project Mm -hmm. management. So we added a project management tool. Right now, we still have a lot of spreadsheets. And I think that's how a lot of customers start. Spreadsheets. Before spreadsheets, is probably just a sheet of paper. You, you make that electronic, you have a spreadsheet. But then how do you filter the spreadsheet? How do you organize the spreadsheet? And what does that spreadsheet apply to? So whether it's a CRM, keeping track of your customers and the interactions you have with your customers. Now we have also ways of looking at our stock, like the stock of uh, consumables that we have in the, right. in the company. So there are really a, a lot of different tools. And, and we've tried actually, as we've grown to sometimes take one step too fast and quickly realize that we needed to be with the tools that we needed or that we were previously using. You have to find the tools that support your growth at that time. Eric, how many people currently report to you and what are their roles? So today, nobody reports to me. I'm a chief without a team. It means that I interact with absolutely Mm -hmm. everyone. (laughs) We're building this team, so we will actually add people to my team, which will be more with regards to both the analytics of market, the strategic growth of market. Today, I have taken a step aside from pure sales and look more at the partnerships. So I will be building this team while I was still taking care of both marketing and sales as we were growing that. And before they became sufficiently mature, I had those teams right. under me. Well, you know, you, you say you speak to everybody. We know different people have different communication styles. How do you deal with that within your company? I have to speak French half the day. No, we, we, we all speak English, but, but because half the team is in France, I, I do speak with them daily and often in French. I have that advantage. But it's important and maybe an aspect to why I feel so comfortable in the position that I have that I do have a scientific background and I've added on that. So it's easy for me to go to the lab. Well, the lab's just a few feet away from my office here to have interactions of a scientific nature with the scientists on our team, to have a discussion of a marketing nature with the marketing team, to talk to the salespeople, to interact with the executive team or the board members or the future investors and do a pitch. So there are different ways of communicating with people. And I do those changes somewhat seamlessly. I feel like all that gives you a really good perspective for communicating in different ways. So I'll ask you, what's your best tip for internal communication that you've picked up during your career? See, I'm taking a pause because I'm thinking about what you yeah. asked me. So that's probably my tip. Take a pause, listen to the person, process that information, and then decide how you're going to communicate. I'm taking a pause right now, Eric, to just soak that in. <laughs> that's a good tip. I'm going to remember that. You don't have to answer right away, right? There's strength in actually taking the time to give the right answer to communicate. Brilliant. I I love it. What do you see as the best case scenario for GenoSkin? How much of the injectable pharma market is left to conquer? And, you know, what else can this company achieve after that? Oh, so so we started, uh, I was talking about us starting with the mission of being an alternative to animal testing and, and now having a mission of being an alternative to human testing. Our objective is that we impact drug development and ultimately patients' lives by accelerating and de-risking drug development. So there's still a lot left to do. This whole industry has to change. So we've been talking about the use of animals in drug development. Various regulators, whether it's the EPA, the FDA, the EMA, choose your acronym wherever it is in the world, everybody agrees animal testing will stop. So... How do we develop a drug and how do we change that dramatic curve that we have, which shows the drop in efficiency as we're increasing the technologies on drug development? How do we find better drugs for less money and take less time doing it? 
So really addressing those points. And we believe that generating human data before you even go into a human trial is the solution. So that basically the solution may be, well, everything's already been figured out. Let's just check that last box. Oh yeah, it does work perfectly in a human as we had predicted. And so a lot of what we're doing now today is building those prediction tools, leveraging the fact that we can maintain human skin alive and functional. If you could go back to the first day you started at GenoSkin, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself that could have saved you a lot of time, money, or effort? Listen to your gut. Don't get pushed too much by other people to bring on tools faster than you need them. Because rebuilding after that is a headache, a cost of time, can strain relationships for something that you were trying to fix something that wasn't broken. So do plan for growth, but don't try to do that growth too fast. Eric, why does my arm swell up after I get a shot? <laughs> what drug was injected? It's funny because we can actually determine that. We can actually see at the molecular level, at the genetic level. We can see what happens when a drug comes into your arm. A lot of the biologicals or the vaccines will cause what's called injection site reactions. I might get nerdy here for a second, but it is when one particular cell called the mast cell just explodes and all those little granules then trigger inflammation within your tissue. And that is what in turn may stimulate your nerves, make it painful, may cause an edema, a swelling. So that's a fancy thing called injection site reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Getting nerdy with Ben. <laughs> I didn't think that was very nerdy. I, th I thought you put it in terms even I could understand. I appreciate that, Eric. <laughs> all, all right, last question here. Let's say you're at a party. I'm sure you go to a lot of parties, Eric. And you want to impress people with a piece of trivia about human skin models or injectable pharma. What nugget do you dig out that always surprises everyone that hears it? So I'll, I'll repeat what you may not have caught uh, a little mm. bit earlier. The skin is actually alive in our hands. So when Susie, John, Paul, uh, Annette go have their surgery and they look great in a bathing suit, their tissue is in our lab and it can get the same suntan. And sunburn too, I imagine. And sunburn, absolutely. That's, free, that's freaky so but fascinating. It can react to the same drug. So yeah, so the, the hair will grow, it will, um, it will tan under, uh, under UV, uh, it will repair itself if you do an incision on it. It's alive. Actually, we have it on our, on our packaging. It says, keep me alive. So that the folks in the shipping departments at, at, at the companies that get it uh, know to take care of it and then bring it quickly to the research teams. My mind is blown. Thank you so much for teaching me that, Eric. <laughs> That's all I got for you. Thanks so much for being on the show. Hey, it was a great time. Thanks, Ben. That was my conversation with Eric Merle. Thanks so much to Eric for being with us. Again, I'm Ben Goldstein. I'm the VP of Marketing at Nutshell. Nutshell is a simple and affordable CRM that helps thousands of B2B organizations around the world get organized. We know if you're a small business owner, there's a point where Google Docs and spreadsheets just don't cut it anymore, and that's where we come in. We help B2B organizations of all kinds get off spreadsheets and start tracking their contacts and leads so they can drive more revenue. Every Nutshell subscription comes with unlimited contact and data storage and live access to our friendly Michigan-based support team starting at just $16 a month. Visit Nutshell.com to start a 14-day free trial and use the coupon code POD20 when you purchase to get 20% off your first year's subscription. That's all for now. Special thanks to our executive producer, Seth Ressler at Community Marketing Revolution. Thanks to my co-producer, Ashante Clemens. And thank you for listening. Take care. Until next time.